Do you have any tips for me? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. This is episode number 87, Tips and Suggestions, here at Working at Woodworking, where I, Roger Kugler, am trying to encourage all you skilled woodworkers out there. People have been doing this for a while. You've been thinking that you can make money doing your hobby, but you just need a little shove to get you over the edge, get you to hang out a shingle, make some business cards, and start helping your community with your skills. This, the last episode of 2023, we are going to talk about kind of a mishmash of tips and suggestions I've accumulated over, well, since the last tips and suggestions episode. And don't miss the Christmas episode that I'm going to load on Christmas Eve. I think you'll find it interesting and hopefully inspirational. So I have about 15 tips and suggestions. These aren't long enough to really be made into a episode themselves. So I just kind of gather them up and we would just do one great big blowout of all of these random different things that I think will help you that you might find interesting. Uh, So number one on the list in no particular order is joining on a bandsaw. This is the video done by our uh, British mentor, Paul Sellers. You know, we've all faced this. We we have a nice piece of wood that we want to turn into a, a drawer front, but it's got a twist in it. It's, it's, it's warped. And you can't run that through a table saw, you know, to, to size it up. Very, very dangerous. Please don't do that. And we've got to get this thing flat. Now you could run it through my 12 inch helical head South Bend model AB1113 joiner. Yeah, $5,300, which I don't actually own. And you might not either. So if you don't have a joiner, what do you do? What I do, I grab my scrub plane. And this is just an an old jack plane that I've kind of widened the mouth of and put a little bit of a camber, a a radius on the, the iron. And I can use that and go over and knock the high ends, the corners off of that uh, warped board. I mean, well, quite honestly, almost as fast as you could run it through a joiner. And once I, I get that reasonably flat, not perfect, I take it over to the planer and I put that newly plane side down on the flat bed and run it through about a 64th of an inch, maybe a 32nd. I, I don't want to flatten that board with the planer because they have the big pressure rollers on there and it will take a cup out of a board perfectly and then you end up with a thinner cupped board so you you just have to barely skin the 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 top of that board to take off the tiniest little bit not to deform it at all i know you can build a sled and you can use wedges and hot glue and all this other stuff did i mention that i'm lazy yeah so that's the way I do it. And once I get that top edge, you know, playing down so that I've got, you know, reasonably good contact, I flip it over, do the other one, and I just flip it back and forth. And as long as I have a an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch to work with, I can get almost any uh, warped board like this flat um, down to three quarter. But Paul Sellers shows us a different method where he runs this through a bandsaw. Very, very unique. I'm not going to try to describe that. Uh, There's a link in the show notes. You can go and watch the video. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Okay, number two, the difference between methods and technique. I had had a student who was really struggling with making sense of it all. And he he self he's described himself as knowing a lot about woodworking, but not really knowing anything about woodworking. And I diagnosed this as too much YouTube, not enough making. He was definitely suffering from watching, not doing syndrome. 
Or you could also say he was lost in the minutia. Or if you're a real Latin scholar, minutiae. And I have seen this a lot, well, honestly, since the advent of YouTube. Because there's just so much information so readily available. It used to be you had to buy a book or a magazine to, you know, kind of figure things out. Now you can go on a binge and, and end up in just this, this woodworking coma, you know, where you really can't function anymore. So an example, cutting dovetails. You want to dovetail the corners of a drawer versus cutting dovetails with a saw, cutting do- dovetails on a table saw, cutting dovetails with a router, cutting dovetails on a bandsaw. Our technique is cutting dovetails. But the method you choose is up to you and the tools you have, the skills you have, and just what you want to do. And this is where I think a lot of people really get in trouble. Let's take mortise and tenon joint. It's a very, well, really a simple joint. It's also incredibly strong. But people get lost. And I've had people just ask me, should I buy a mortising machine? There's other options out there. Should you buy a wood rat? Maybe you should buy a Lehigh jig. Or you could just use a router. Oh, but I would, I only have a fixed space. Do I need to buy a plunge router? Or maybe I could just buy a plunge base made for my router. You see where we kind of get lost in here? What you're trying to do is to make a mortise and tenon joint. This is why I'm a huge advocate of learning traditional hand tool woodworking techniques. You need to connect this piece of wood to this piece of wood with a mortise and tenon. You lay that out, you know, with pencil and a combination square or a tri-square or a mortise gauge. You pick up a chisel and you start whacking the crap out of it. If you're really sophisticated, you use a mortising chisel for this. It's not hard. It doesn't take that long. And it's actually kind of self-satisfying in a way. And then you cut your, your tenon. If you know how to use a handsaw, you can cut a tenon. I know, I know. You could also cut that on a bandsaw. You can cut that on a router. You could figure out how to cut it with a coffee maker if you worked hard enough at it. And you put the two together and you've got a perfectly good mortise and tenon joint. So if you know how to do that by hand, then you can just step that up. Maybe you are tired of chopping, so you use a drill, maybe a brace and bit, and you hog out the waste and then clean up the mortise with a chisel. This isn't rocket science. So once you understand what you're actually trying to do, then it makes the method a lot easier to choose. So don't get the method and the actual technique confused in here. And besides, you should, you know, just use a domino. Whoa, no, did you see that? I can't believe he did that. No, that is unbelievable. Yeah, okay, I just lost about half my audience there. Number three, if you can, be selective in the work you do. There are some jobs that will make you money. There are some jobs that will lose you money. There are some jobs that you will learn a lot and expand your skills. But rarely is there a job that you will learn a lot, expand your skills, and make money. Unless you bid it right. For instance, I got an email from somebody. They sent me pictures. They needed uh, some arch top doors. This is not something that you do every day. And oh my gosh, how can you just say no to those nice graceful curves? This is a rather challenging woodworking project. But if you've never done it before, approach it with a little bit of skepticism. Because if you're kind of in a a time and cash crunch, who isn't? You might want to pass on that because you think you can do that in 10 hours and you might end up 16 hours into this project. Hence, you didn't make any money on it. Unless you kind of have the forethought to realize, 
I'm going to need to tack on another 20%, maybe 30%, because I really don't know what I'm doing here. Just saying, be aware of what jobs you can make money on and what jobs you can learn from. And there's, there's, there's no harm in learning from a job because you're going to present a customer with a number, and if they accept that, go for it. And if they don't accept that, well, maybe you could lower price a little bit, or that's a, a, a clear sign that you just pass on the job altogether. So if you can be selective, you'll probably make more money. Number four. You remember back in 2022 when the federal government came out with the $600 rule? That was a rule that would require every third-party payment processor, i.e. PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, and the other 13,273 credit card cash processors, you would have to declare that amount of money as income on your federal tax filings. Or those payments would have to be designated as a gift or reimbursement. And there was a lot of flack about this from just about everyone. And they decided that, I think it was in December, they decided that they were not going to do that for, I think it was 2022. And then they tried it for 2023, and they decided, nah, we're not going to do this either. A large part of that may have been due to the severe labor shortage that the IRS, you know, is experiencing. We just haven't been funding the IRS, you know, very well. Um, so what about 2024? Nah, we're not going to do it for 2024 either. So kind of rest assured, everybody really had their hackles up about this, and rightfully so, uh, I believe. And I may be very naive, you know, you do your taxes, you give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And if you're in business, you're Joe's woodworking and you're getting money through PayPal or Venmo or, or, you know, something like that. Well, you should be, you know, doing your accounting properly and reporting what needs to be reporting. Uh, but this was going to be very awkward whenever you needed to reimburse your parents who paid largely for a family vacation and you would have to transfer, you know, a large sum of money to them. You'd have to designate that as a reimbursement or the IRS would be breathing down your neck. So, nope, don't worry about it. Not happening this year. Number five, retail pricing. When you're setting your prices on things like Etsy or Amazon or Squarespace, make sure you're adding in the cost of sale. So if Etsy's charging you, what, 14, 15%? You know, for all the the goods and services that they provide, and I'm not saying that's unreasonable, not at all. Make sure you factor that into your price. You know, if you figured out that you could sell a twidget for for a hundred dollars, you counting your labor and your materials and your time and your overhead and things like that, you need to also factor in that fifteen percent into that price. So. Depending on how you, you, you do that, you might end up with $115 that you really should be selling on that particular platform. Now, if you're selling on more than one platform, let's say Etsy and your own website, can you have different prices on different platforms? Yeah. There's no rule or law that says that you can't do that. You know, on my website, I'm using PayPal for the, the payment processing, and that's like, what, 3%, I think? So I could have lower prices on my own website than on Etsy. However, that website's not free. You know, I'm paying, you know, to have that hosted. I have my own time into, you know, the coding and maintenance and things like that on it. So that should be recovered somehow. So... In the end, you might end up with the same price on both platforms, but make sure that you're just simply pricing it right so that you're recovering that cost. 
Oh, one other little factor on selling on a big platform like Etsy and your own platform, sales tax. If you've noticed, if you've been buying anything online, you're paying sales tax, unless you're in one of those few states that don't have a sales tax. So due to recent legislation, which we've covered before, these big platforms, anyone selling over, I think it's $100,000, although that number is going to go up, uh, in, in sales have to re- cover sales tax no matter where the customer lives. If you're under that $100,000 threshold, like myself, I don't have to collect sales tax other than the state that I live in. So that could be attractive to some customers. You know, people just kind of get into this habit that, yes, I bought it online. Of course, I paid, paid sales tax. But if you point out to them that if you go, if they go to your website, you don't have to collect sales tax to ship it to their state. That could be a, a deciding factor for some people. Number six, order next year's supplies now. So hopefully you've had a good year. You're scheduled to make a profit. And I know that you've been keeping your books absolutely immaculately accurate up to date as of yesterday or maybe last week or last month, last quarter, and you're going to make a profit. You can lower your tax bill by increasing your expenses. So how do you increase your expenses? Order the supplies you're going to need next year now. Sandpaper, adhesives, just regular shop towels, paper towels, nitrile gloves, the things that you normally use, your shop supplies. Go ahead and order those now. Get them on... 2023's books as an expense, that's going to lower your overall tax bill. You might be considering adding a new machine. If you're thinking about getting a new planer or joiner next year, well, can you squeeze it in this year? There are some nice sales. And then you could probably write that off on your taxes for 2023. So talk to your tax professional. You know, Seek their advice. This might be a good way to uh, kind of lower the uh, tax burden come next April. If you've been listening on Google Podcast Player to your favorite podcast, like Working at Woodworking, um, that's going to go away in 24. They are moving the their podcast player to YouTube music. So it's still going to be there. Obviously, Google owns YouTube. So it's just going to kind of shift a little bit. I, I have no idea what the mechanics of that is going to look like, but I'm quite sure that they're going to figure that out. Now, number eight, this is a really interesting one. If you remember back to episode 73, where we talked about bugs in the bedpost and how to deal with creepy crawlies, woodworms, powder post beetles, and all that ilk, a really good YouTube video from a Brit who treats woodworms with a kiln. And I had mentioned in the, in the, that episode that you can, you know, have your wood kiln dry, but that's not really very practical for most of us. We're not going to go and rent, you know, space in a kiln to dry probably very small pieces of wood. But he suggests that, and this is what he does, he builds his own kiln. And it wasn't rocket science. I was really impressed. He basically used some foam boards and uh, incandescent light bulbs, if you can find those. And he popped a, a temperature sensor in there, thermometer, and he cooked them. And it didn't take very long. He had a nice piece of wood that he was turning into a, a mantle. And he wanted to make sure that there was nothing uh, alive in it. And so he cooked it. He brought it up to um, about 140 degrees for, I think it was a half hour or so, uh, maybe an hour. And everything was dead. So check out his video, link in the show notes. This could very easily open up a new avenue. I could see if someone brought you a chair you could easily build a, a chamber around there with some of the foam board and effectively treat it 
without use of chemicals or, or anything like that. Now, tip number nine or suggestion number nine, stop using your shop vac the wrong way. Pro tips by the funny carpenter on, again, YouTube. This is a fantastic video. I'm really glad I found this. He's talking about something that we all use, a shop vac. You know, a lot of us may not have a, a central, you know, dust collection system, you know, with a big, you know, cyclone dust collector and bag and, and we're using shop vacs. So watch this video, learn how to save some money using how to improve your efficiency using the shop vac and most importantly, increase the air quality in your shop. Very, very good video. Number 10, using pallet wood. Danger. This is a website that I don't even know how I found it, but not all pallet wood should be made into a headboard. And I know that that's a very, very popular thing for a lot of people to do, either, you know, due to the price of, of lumber now, um, or just for, for the style of the, the reclaimed look. But this website points out some things you need to be concerned about. This is a little related to number eight, but wood pallets have to be treated for insects, especially if they're going to be used internationally. And pallets have a certification stamp, the same as your two before at the lumberyard has. And you need to look for that stamp because that's going to tell you how that pallet has been treated treated. Now, they can be heat treated, which I believe is whenever they just treat the individual pallet, or maybe as a group. They can be made from kiln dry wood, which is going to kill any little critters, or they can be chemically treated. Now, the most popular chemical apparently is methyl bromide. In fact, the stamp will actually say, I believe it's MB for, for uh, methyl bromide. You probably don't want that for your coffee table. And the other one that I see this all the time is um, uh, they're blue. The, the palettes are blue. That is some nasty chemical that you do not want to be around. The, the website warns that if there's, if this is painted or like spray painted or anything, pass it by. Don't even mess with it. So if you're into palette wood, hope you know that. Hope you haven't poisoned anybody. Um, number 11. This one is going back to Etsy. Etsy wants you to be a star seller. That means that you ship your products on time and you respond to customer inquiries in a very efficient manner, i.e. within 24 hours. If you're not a star seller, your, your shop is probably not reaching the, the, the height of the search engine within Etsy. They'll kind of, you know, depress that. Because they want to bring their, literally, their, their, their best shops forward. So how do you become a star seller? Well, if you say you're going to ship that in two weeks, ship it within two weeks. They do not like late shipments. And the other thing is responding to conversations. I get people convoing me, which is the Etsy email system, uh, all the time. And... I'll be honest, I've kind of struggled with this. I like my Sundays off. And if you convoed me at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning, I'm not going to see that until probably 9 or 10 o'clock on Monday morning. And I kind of, you know, I didn't have a very high rating on that. Uh, you know, God forbid if you actually want to have a weekend off. So Etsy did do something kind of help you out. They created an autoresponder. In a lot of places, a lot of companies use this, that if you're out of the office, it autoresponds with a, we're sorry, we're out of the shop right now, and can't respond to your message. We will get back to you at the earliest possible convenience. Wonderful. You can turn this on for during the week for overnight you know, if your hours are like nine to five, they have to be at least eight hours 
in duration. And if they, if you get a convo outside of those hours, it activates the autoresponder. Now, here's another thing is use the vac vacation mode. If you're going away for, well, let's say you're going to Vegas for the big, big, you know, uh, woodworking manufacturing tool convention, turn on that vacation mode so that you don't get dinged for not auto responding or you're going to have to check, you know, your your website at least daily. You may not want to do that whenever you're sunning yourself on a beach in uh, Cozumel or some nice sunny place. If you are teaching woodworking classes, this could be a great resource for you. teachsafely.com. Obviously link in the show notes. The teach Safely.com website says that they are the nation's first ever industry certified standardized training program for power tools and machinery. Okay. It's free. Okay. Made by professionals by making safety engaging and concise. Eh, okay. Made for professionals for optimal retention of safety. Okay, could be better worded. Be safe, learn it right the first time. Okay, so basically what this is is a website with a bunch of safety training videos. They cover everything, uh, even handheld power tools, which, you know, oftentimes get lost. If you don't use a, especially a corded hand drill correctly, you can rip your, your arms off. But they, they cover, you know, all the, the handheld power tools, the stationary power tools, table saws, band saws, joiners, lathes, everything. And go to the website and you'll need to register as either a teacher, a student, an employee, or an employer. And you can use this to supplement your own classes. Now, I go over all the safety procedures for a particular tool uh, in my classes, but you can encourage your students to also go here and watch these videos. What I liked about this is that the videos are, are very well done. They cover all the important facts, most of the important facts, and they're concise. You go to YouTube to look up table saw safety, and you just have a new career. There are so many of them, and most of them say kind of the same things, but this is one-stop shopping. There's a place on there where they can do um, notes, and you can print this out, and you could use this in a workplace. In fact, a lot of manufacturers are using this to send their new hires or their current employees to watch these videos, print out the note sheet and take the quiz online. The website will notify the employer that this particular employee has successfully completed watching these videos. This is a pretty cool idea. I kind of wish I had thought of it myself. And this may even tie in to, for business, you know, it, it may be, you know, helping to reduce their insurance rates, uh, or it just might be codifying your training process, which that can be a major stumbling block for, you know, kind of that small to mid-range manufacturer. So anyway, check that out, teachsafely.com. Did I mention it's free? Yeah, I think I did. Number 13. Sriracha sauce bottles. Yes, you heard me right. Sriracha sauce. That's that really yummy, hot, spicy red stuff that you can put on, well, like anything. Those bottles are made to withstand nuclear waste. Well, sriracha. They won't melt if you put mineral spirits in them or alcohol in them. And they are like free because you bought the sriracha and you ate all that up and then you washed out the bottle really good and then you put whatever nasty chemical in them that you want. And you didn't have to go out and buy a nasty chemical bottle and spend a bunch of money. And sriracha's yummy. Number 14. Man, have you shipped anything lately? Shipping is so cheap. 
I can't believe it. I'm shipping products to California from the middle of the country for half what I paid last year. Unbelievable. I mean, when's the last time you actually got excited about shipping costs? I mean, usually it's like, oh yeah, shipping's going up. Gotta raise my prices. USPS is kind of at the forefront of this. They have what's called ground advantage. And I have no idea how they're doing this. I just know that I like it. So you can still ship priority mail and express mail next day type thing. But this ground advantage is a pretty significant price savings. Now, of course, you're always giving up something for when you get less money. And what you're giving up is time. Now, I'm still using Shippo for my Etsy sales and ShipStation for my PayPal transactions through my website. Shippo just never could quite get together with PayPal on this, despite my numerous comments to them. So whenever I use Shippo and I've got the order, it's automatically fed in uh, from Etsy, and I have options. I can ship this USPS priority for... I don't know, 10 bucks, UPS, $15, FedEx, $14, and it will give the days to arrival, how long it's going to take. Priority mail, it might say two days. FedEx may say three, so on and so forth. USPS Advantage will say three days. It's not that much difference. I'm shipping stuff to California in four to five days using Ground Advantage. I will take that. I have shipped stuff to California using FedEx Ground in five to seven days, sometimes 10 days. So check this out. I actually shipped a a package to uh, Alaska, and it was not outrageously expensive. I could not believe it. So... If you're shipping a bunch of product, give this a shot if you're not already using it. It can save you some money. So the last one, number 15. Will 2024 be a better year? Well, if you've been staying up on Woodworking Network, which is a a website that you should be subscribed to, link in show notes, the ISM Furniture and Most Industries Predict Positive Economy for 2024. The Institute for Supply Management, that's the ISM, says that the nation's purchasing and supply management experts are predicting a pretty good year. And in this, they measure, I think, 15 different segments of industry. And the furniture and related products is up. Overall, I think 12 of the 15 categories they predict as being a positive year in 2024. They also predict about a 3.2% increase in raw materials. Now, I don't know if they specifically looked at wood products, raw lumber, uh, or if that's other types of, of materials. So, all's not lost. 2024 could be a very good year. I've also heard Some voices in the air say that one of the significant things about 2024 is that there is a an excess manufacturing capacity that due to the to the pandemic, a lot of companies ramped up production to increase the the throughput on what they could make their products for. And now that's kind of sitting a little idle. And anytime that you get idle production, typically you start to see prices creep down a little bit. So this could be a very good year. And if you've been thinking about starting your woodworking business, but you've been all kind of doom and gloom about, you know, the economy, inflation so high, nobody's buying anything. This might perk you up a little bit. You know, this might be the perfect time to go ahead and launch that new business. So recommendations for this uh, episode uh, listed in the show notes, uh, basically all the videos um, that we talked about, uh, also the link to uh, Woodworking Network. 
uh, com. And I'd like to give a special thanks to listeners in Tampa, Florida, USA, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, and the two listeners in Kenya. Really appreciate that. Now, Tis the season to be generous, and if you would like to support working at Woodworking, I would greatly appreciate that. Your donation will go to, well, to be honest, it'll pay for my server and uh, my wonderful editor. If you do think there's a glimmer of hope in 2024, and you are thinking seriously about launching your business, but you still have some questions or maybe you just need a good pep talk, I'm always available for coaching. I plan on taking some uh, downtime between holidays. That's typically when I do some shop projects and <laughs> actually have fun doing woodworking. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you. So until next episode, Merry Christmas and happy woodworking.